Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guests are the director and stars of, without a doubt, one of the wildest, most beautiful, chaotic movies of the year, Monos. The story of a group of teenage soldiers and their hostage deep in the mountains and jungles of an unnamed South American country. Let's take a look at Alejandro Landis's Monos. Everybody, please welcome Moises Arias, Julian Nicholson, and Alejandro Landes. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you so much for making this movie. Uh, it's a rarity that you get to experience movies like this that uh, are seem so much about the cinematic experience and putting the viewer into a completely different context, uh, both without some context and, and with some, than I think uh, most filmmakers and storytellers are, are, are willing to do. Uh, it's a dangerous thing to do. Um, I don't even really know how you write a script like this. So can you, can you start, start, start there for me? Is it a series of images for you, an idea based around a series of images? Or do you have a very straightforward, concrete story in your mind that you then remove and pull away from a little bit? Well, the idea um, comes from, in many ways, the country where I'm from, from Colombia, a country that's experienced 60 years of civil war and it's been going on for so long and so many different factions and sides and alliances shift and there's peace agreements and they break that in a way, um, it wasn't something you could go at with clear ideological premises, but something that had this kind of ghostly uh, feel. And that's what inspired the story, to try to um, break any binary notion of like future, past, man, woman, paradise, or hell, and try to get at something that you lived like through the stomach, through the skin. And I think that's what cinema has. You know, it appeals to your conscious, like a story does, but also your subconscious, kind of like dreams do. So the idea was to, to, to live this politically sensitive allegory, but like a dream. Create a dream that has political references, but no clear political alignments. Well, today, I think the world's experiencing a lot of irregular conflict. It's not like our grandparents or our great-grandparents in World War I, World War II, where you had these epic front lines and flags, and you know who was against who. Now you ask people on the street, hey, what's going on in Syria or Afghanistan? Factions. Wars, exactly. Yeah. Wars without a clear beginning, without a clear end. Wars fought in the shadows, drones, uh, covert operations, special ops. It's all, um, there's like a fog of war, if you will. And I think that that's why I think it makes this a very timely war film, although it's not only that. No, it's not only that at all. It's also in some ways oddly feels like, and I'm, I know I'm wrong about this, but like an explosive metaphor for puberty. <laughs> And I it don't is. know if that's like intentional or not, but it's just having these teenagers at this time in the midst of this exper experimenting as well as experiencing all of it feels like this idea that like puberty is itself is like some sort of internal war. Well, exactly right. I mean, it's the time in your life when you're asking yourself who you are and that kind of crashes against who you want to be. You also want to belong, but you want to be alone. Your body starts changing. Hair comes out in places, the timbre of your voice. And I think that you're not a child, but you're also not an adult. And in a way, that, that creates this, this, this crisis. 
that I think is a perfect kind of um, parallel to an exterior conflict, which which is war. So you have these two things going on, like a mirror: the interior conflict of adolescence, and then the exterior conflict of of, of a warlike scenario. Where did you find this mountain that is literally in the clouds? I mean, those op those first images of the film where our characters are living above the clouds is something that I've never really seen on film before, outside of maybe an image of Koyana Scotsi or something. But what made you choose that location and go there? And what did that metaphor mean for you that these people existed above the clouds? Right. Well, that's um, that's a very very unique ecosystem. It's um, very special, and it's about thirteen thousand feet up in the air. So we were shooting with very little oxygen up there, and it's also the reservoir of Ecuador and Colombia's water. So it's actually a wetland, but it's a highland at the same time, and the water just trickles down the mountain, gaining, gaining, gaining more speed until it ends up in torrents in the lowlands and the rivers and the jungle. So the idea was to follow the path of water. And that water starts darkening as well. You know, you don't have the translucency or the transparency of the water um, by the time it reaches uh, the jungle rapids. And that's, in a way, what, what the film does. It takes you literally on, on a river journey uh, following the path of water. Um, I'm curious, when, you, when you're shooting on set, and if you could answer this as well, how, how straightforward is the script that you're working off of, and how much are you... I, I, I don't want to say figuring things out when you get there, but improvising and playing around and catching new things. Well, there's a lot, I think, of... Um, I mean, the screenplay was, was very developed, very detailed. There's also a storyboard and a very strong technical screenplay. But because we were shooting in incredibly remote locations that change, the weather changes on a dime, and there's a combination of people that have vast experience, like Moises and Julianne, uh, juxtaposed... Um, young people that are before a film camera for the first time, then there's something like a combustion. There's something really interesting there that you don't know exactly what's going to happen. So the idea was we knew what we had, what we wanted to do, but we always knew that we wanted more than the, than what was on the page. You say that there's a storyboard, but uh, you know there's a shot early on in the film of a mountain wall and panning across the mountain wall and the colors from this sort of uh, the chalk of this wall almost burst in some ways. And I can't imagine having something like that storyboarded without having seen, been there and seen what that wall itself. Yeah, of course. The idea was once we saw the locations and chose the, the final actors, rewrite the screenplay to make sure that that's there. So uh, during, I mean, the real foundations of the film are about the weeks we spent together before shooting the first frame. I mean, it was great that Julianne... Your actors. Exactly. Julianne wow. Moises didn't just show up a couple days before shooting. They were there trying to create this brotherhood, this sisterhood that we needed to build. And you know, we were in a place with very little cell phone reception at all, cold, humid, and uh, there was no world outside of Monos while we were shooting, in the jungle as well. I mean, it was a... Uh, Even yeah. more so in the jungle. Can you... No access to the... Out we had a satellite phone which we weren't allowed to use because it was too expensive. But in case of emergency, that was that was like, you know, so we were we were with each other in a very I, real way. I imagine you kind of maybe not in the jungle or on a mountain, but sort of prefer that on the set of a movie. I mean, people call cut and everybody keeps talking about what they're doing and doesn't jump into their phone and start. There, There is a magic to that 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 you cannot create if you're each going home to your own hotel room at the end of the night. And especially in these locations, which so informed just our feeling day to day. It's a, it's a huge um, luxury that we had that. The luxury is the last word I should use to describe making this movie, but it's, it's, a, it's an incredible gift to be able to have that quality of time, for sure. So that period of time before uh, rolling, rolling, rolling film for the first time, the six weeks, you said? Or six, it was about five weeks. Five weeks, we sending... Yeah a lot of time to have your actors there for pre-production. What was that period of time like for the two of you before you started shooting? What were the two, what were you doing? I was not there for that long. That was for the, 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 um, for the, for the, for the monos, for, for the, the training, training, training and for the really? developing that relationship because Alejandro wanted to keep a separation between my character and them. Maybe. I was there before, but I, w I was not there for, for the, the very intense period that they had together. Yeah, not, not only were we, um, you know, um, they're, um, you know, discussing with Alejandro and, and uh, you know, everything that comes with uh, preparing a film, wardrobe and all that. But um, Alejandro also had um, 
about 20, 25 kids there at, at, at the beginning. Um, f- uh, really, since most of these kids weren't actors, uh, putting us together and, and seeing um, who would, um, you know, vibe with who, who kind of didn't like each other. And uh, the military training was um, also an aspect of it because we had to see who could withstand the difficulty of what we were trying to, to do you know on on in, in the screenplay you you know you, you knew what you signed up to do and it turned out to be a lot more difficult than than <laughs> uh, what was expected but you know 4 a.m waking up that's um, a, 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 a chant a, a calling that um, various um, illegal armies um, adapted and, and we adapted it to uh, our our squadron um, but waking up at that time to that was incredibly alarming and then just doing hours of uh, pisa suave training which translates to silent steppers um, was was incredibly difficult to then do acting classes for three hours with with, with these kids with the most important uh, scenes of the film and and um, after those five weeks we really went from 25 to eight. It was a beautiful experience. So you would do boot camp, essentially, for the first five hours of the day, six hours of the day, and then you would start doing acting classes, going Correct. over the scenes? Correct. The most important scenes? Correct. Well, um, the kids weren't very athletic. Sadist, <laughs> well, no, no, well, no, 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 no. We were, we well, were it says living. It was the screenplay, but, uh, but the kids just thought there were random scenes, exercises. Yeah. Yeah. They had no idea. Yeah. They didn't know that it was the screenplay that they were working on. And it was a way to rewrite the screenplay as well, because as Moises was pointing out, um, we knew then who who got along with who, who didn't, what chemistry there was in this kind of mini community of about 20. And that's how we chose the eight monos. So it was a little bit of a big brother scenario going on. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but there it was, it was really, it's the foundation of the, of the film is there. I was there for it. That, sh- that was amazing. That was uh, incredible. And when did you show up as the hostage? Basically, like right around the time to start shooting, because you were going to be separate. Yeah, I was. I was there. I think I came a few days before, just to sort of, I, I don't know, land, acclimate. Um, and I was, I was filming in the mountains for three weeks, and then I went home for a week. And it's funny because in the mountains, you can tell the the two locations that we film in are so wildly different. Each feels like it's like another world. And it was so cold and wet on the mountain. And then so I left the mountain and half the crew had never even seen their faces because they were wrapped up and, and we were all bundled up. And then I get to the, after taking two planes and two cars and a hike and a raft to get to the camp where we were, it was literally like people were playing cards, people are shirtless. It's in the like jungle? In the jungle, yeah. like on cots, smoking cigarettes. I was like, what year is this? Where have they brought me? In a peninsula. And a pelin- <laughs> when you see the film, you know where the two rivers, where the two rivers meet? That's where we were. That, that's where we camped, and that's where we filmed. I, I like have such a visceral reaction to that shot at the end to see that's, that's where we were for that length of time. But... Um, it was remarkable and and uh, an amazing thing to to spend that time. So then I was three weeks in the jungle, all living in tent, no electricity, no running water, um, torrential downpours every night from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Um, you know, amazing bugs, snakes, everything. It was like, yeah. yeah, yeah. What Julianne did wasn't only when she was shooting. What was amazing is that, for example, there was a day I think she spent the entire day in the cell just drawing on the walls because we wanted to make sure that the drawings on the walls of someone that had spent so much time in this cell were actually from the character, drawn by the character's hand and things like this. Which is so nice and I I so admire Alejandro for his attention to detail because so often something like that, you know, a props master, a sets coordinator or production designer would think of that and you would arrive and it will have been done for you. But so for me to have the time in that cold, dark, wet cell... um, (laughs) And to have the you know the the charcoal in my hand and to be able to think like what would I want to see if I was here and also it ha- we did it gradually so it's as time passes in the film you see more drawings on the wall and it's such a subtle thing but it's those details I think that that bring just some of the magic to life in this this very special movie. Well, I would imagine because so much um, 
context is is sort of taken away from the characters themselves. There isn't much backstory presented in the film, uh, rightfully. I think it makes it a completely unique experience for that. If you were to show up and a prop master had done all these drawings, it could change everything that you thought about the character because there was no backstory in the script alone. He would have made up something completely different than you would have made up because there was sort of no... Um, no dictionary to refer to for who she was. It's true, and this is why I love talking to you, Ricky, because huh. you think of things like that, and it's very true. I, I, he, they would have a different idea than me, and I've had that happen on other sets where you imagine the room that your character lives in, and then you go, and you'd be like, oh, I didn't know she read Nancy Drew, like, and things are, details are given to you which can shift that, so it's a, it's a great privilege to be able to spend that quality of time discovering that, car that person. No, I was just going to say that that was the big gift that um, all the actors really gave gave me was that time because the film is an exercise in what's most difficult in life and film, which is presence, mm. because you don't have all these um, things to hang on to, these stickers, like a first name or a last name or a backstory or a voiceover necessarily. So the characters are there. You get to know them, the humanism of the trenches. You don't know if they're fighting for the left or the right. Um, you don't know their last name. You don't get a monologue in the beginning of the third act yeah. of the movie that is like, this Telling is how I got here. <laughs> exactly, you know? or this is what happened to my mother or my yeah. dad. Exactly. Although you do see a bit in the end of what is possibly how they begin. As you know, yeah. there's that scene towards the end of the film where there's, um, there's possibly a scene that alludes to the beginning of violence. Right. Yeah. It's so interesting. I mean, this is tangential, but that third act scene of the monologue about the past that sort of tells the story, it never works in any movie. And they and it's always in a movie, you know, like not this one, but it anytime it comes up in a movie, you know exactly what it is, why it's there, and any sort of emotion is stripped from it because it's just you know the purpose that they're trying to serve. It becomes well, really boring. It reminds you of table conversation when people are like, so what do you do? Yeah. And, you know, what's your address? And people are trying to grab onto those type of things that basically are on the sheet of a doctor's office or a job application to try to get a sense of who you are. When those things, sometimes they might help, sometimes they're entirely wrong. Well, the sense of who you are is how you play the game. <laughs> You know, like, I mean, if that's how you're getting to know somebody, it's like how much fun you are or how mean you are while playing the game. Exactly right. Uh, Julianne, uh, you know, the kids get dragged in the mud a lot in this movie, <laughs> literally, and, and beat on each other and have very charged physical moments because so much of the film is about uh, primalness and, and the physicality of the situation. But you also have these moments with the children as well, which is a completely different... Uh, feeling as a viewer, I'm wondering what that was like as a, a, a as an actress to have to explore these moments. Oh, um, well, it was you know, Alejandro suggested a few books to me before we started. Um, a man named Thomas Hargrove, who ha was lived in captivity, was kidnapped for just over a year, and wow. Ingrid Betancourt over seven years, and it's a very interesting thing that dynamic between uh, prisoner and captor because these kids, like they don't necessarily have any attachment to me or even why I'm there. They're babysitters. So depending on the, on the character, you know, and in real life too, some of these people, they form friendships. It's not always, it's such a complicated relationship. Well, because they're babysitters of someone who would be their babysitter. Yeah, and, and, and we filmed so much that some, we filmed some things and there's a few things there where, you know, they're in like having a mud fight together, but then it's like, but then they like stick her in her cell for three days and you don't, so it's, it's, it's being present in whatever moment that is, and all those things are going on all the time. And it was similar with, with my engagement with them. You know, as Alejandro, as I said, kept us sort of separate. I was always living sort of on my own, in my own tent or in my own room, and they were all together all the time. And so both things were happening where there was a separation and an isolation. I don't speak Spanish. Um, six of the eight didn't speak a word of English. But then there was other times where there was crossover and there was joy and dancing. And um, so it was sort of walking that very fine line throughout, throughout the film and throughout um, just li living and being there. Well, you make a good point about the kidnappers also being kidnapped themselves in yeah. a way, right? And also uh, Julianne does something be from navigating the idea of being a victim to being a victimizer, right, in the film. And I think that's something really interesting because the character of the doctora has almost a maternal quality, but then later um, 
you can see that 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 turns violent and that's very strong and i think that's one of the things that that julianne does does so amazingly in the film was that you see the weight of that violence on 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 her soul well there's also a fear that she doesn't that she has and also doesn't have of her captors because her captors are kids. There are moments where she is willing to push them away or throw things at them that you wouldn't imagine the captive of an adult army being willing and, and sort of able to bring themselves to do. Yeah. Well, it's actually born out of a real life uh, situation. Uh, it's very common, you know, kidnapping since the beginning or, ta or hostage taking from the beginning of war. And we read several accounts, uh, Julianne cited some of them, where um, be it in Colombia or outside, a group has some, has a kidnapped person for economic or political leverage, and the higher ups will do the negotiating. But what's the cheapest way to just take care of this person while the negotiation happens? Well, giving it to the lowest rung of the ladder in the military hierarchy, and many times those are the youngest soldiers that are just kids. So you're in this sort of Neverland scenario where you are kidnapped in a remote place and your captors or who's there on the day to day are a bunch of kids who are themselves living their whole drama of adolescence, as you pointed out. Yeah. I think the specifically for me, the one scene uh, when um, I forgive me for getting the for forgetting the character's name, a bomb goes off behind her. Swede. And two, Swede. Yeah. And the two of you get thrown together in an almost romantic maternal moment happens it's a it's a blend really for this for this child who is holding on to you and your character gets swept up in it for just a second obviously because she's in the midst of trauma and is being touched in a sensitive way but has a realization of what's happening i mean shooting a scene like that talking about a scene like that can't be can't be easy or maybe it is because it's so clear what um, it is. I mean, I, easy, def, yeah. I wouldn't call it, say easy is not the right word, but um, we Alejandro, there's a there's these little sort of pods, a couple of them up on the mountain, and we went in there, um, the other actress and I and Alejandro, and talked about the scene and what was going on, and he talked to each of us separately as well. And so when it came time to filming, I mean, in that that cave is dark and scary anyway, and and I could understand that thing of being untouched, unloved, like for that amount of time and, you know, as humans, the things that we want are so basic, actually, to, to stay alive, to, to keep our sanity. Um, and so I feel like that was a fine line to walk, but Alejandro was pretty clear about what he was hoping to capture, and I, I, I feel very proud of that scene and the work that we, we both did in it. Especially the moment where she pulls away and is holding the gun and is crying and is trying to prove to her that she got one up on her, was tricking her, but clearly that's not what was happening. I loved that scene. I love I that, like moment. that moment. I like that moment. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, glad you saw that one. Uh, Moises, uh, your character uh, thinks he's the big shot in a lot of ways and is the, the leader of, uh, of these kids, but like any child, he's filled with insecurities and doubts about himself. And I think every time you are trying to lead them, you bring an element of that just behind the eyes in your performance. And I was wondering how you captured that. That's an excellent question. I think, um, you know, um, Alejandro really um, developed this character with me trying to, uh, you know, ride the line of a, a person, a, a child wanting to be loved and, and possibly respected. And, and at the same time, when, when power is at, anybody's uh, grasp, you know, um, what a, a, a child would do when there's no adults, when there's no rules, um, to to really become a dictator, do whatever he wants to do, um, especially when our leader uh, leaves us. Uh, I think we have time for a couple questions. Who has a question? Hey. Hi. Really cool movie. <laughs> so my questions was for the actors, because one thing I noticed is I was thinking how this must have been a really physically taxing role to play with, like, travel and the terrain. And I imagine you even ate differently during this time. So I was just curious if it was a struggle for you and how you prepared to play these roles that seem to really take a lot physically. Um... The own the physical preparation I did was that I had to cut out ice cream. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I needed to be look hungrier than I am in real life. Um, uh, it was it, no grooming. 
all personal grooming out the window. You can see my you can see my white stripe of hair like grow, which was another thing Alejandro wanted, and I love it now when I watch it. I mean, I cringe. It, it's so uncomfortable for me to watch watch, but I also feel like it was such a great idea to show again that passing of time. I and love the like Matthew Broderick esque election bee sting in the eye that you've got. At oh one. yeah, that was a bad bee sting. <laughs> that one hurt. <laughs> Um, but you know, it it was grueling, and yeah, we when, especially when we were in the jungle, we had um, there's no refrigeration, so there's no dairy, there's no you know we ate like smoked meat and beans and rice, but the food was actually really good. We just didn't have maybe much of it. Much of it. <laughs> um, and you know, one thing, the the role, it's a very physical role, and that was a very exciting thing for me. But it was also it was acting. You know, like I wasn't suffering while I was there. It was not comfortable, but it was fun to be challenged to scramble up hills and to make it look like this woman had actually been doing this for days and had been, you know, not eating enough and not sleeping enough and been in these conditions. So, it was it it was hard, but it was also really fun to be able to to do this. I like that you said that. It was hard, but it was acting. I yeah. feel like oftentimes when people talk about a role that shows them suffering in some way, yeah. they rarely want to say it was acting. And yeah. they like to say it was so hard, you know, I, I really had to. And it's like, no, you were acting as well. Yeah, I mean, was it scary to jump into that river? Yes. <laughs> but I knew there's like, you know, people down there on the kayak that hopefully are gonna get, get me when I pass them. But it is, it, we are telling a story and you know, that's, that's part of the job. And luckily I feel like some you can actually really dig into in a deeper way and this was one of those. What is this, what you want to do? Uh, it, this was, like you said, um, so difficult. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of preparation, it was like I said, the the weeks of of, of military training, and it, it didn't stop throughout the film really, um, and you know, um, communicating with these kids, getting my Spanish uh, unconscious, you know, I I think in English, so instead of translating, being able to, if Alejandro wanted the camera to keep on rolling, which um, there was a lot of circumstances where it did, to be able to um, keep up with these kids and still dominate. Um, because there was a lot of, uh, inclined to, you know, not say, not mess up the, this, this two minute take that, uh, was probably special. So, um, you know, just, just really living it. When, once we got to the jungle, we were seriously living it. Yeah. Well, Moises is a big trainer. He likes to train with the cycling, with this the surfing. I mean, he's very disciplined. And so the man who actually is the messenger was initially their trainer, not part of the cast. And he does such a remarkable job, and he really took it seriously because he had actually done those things himself at some point. And so, He's got one of the most incredible torsos I've ever seen. <laughs> yes, It's like does. hypnotic, <laughs> looking at that thing. <laughs> it's really remarkable. You should see him do uh, push-ups. I've never seen anything like that. Uh, one more question. I'm glad you liked the film, by the way. Hello, um, we have a question from our website, buildseries.com, and it kind of goes off the last question. After shooting something this intense physically and emotionally, what did you do during your downtime when you weren't filming in order to relax and get away from? A, a, a lot of, um, you know, there, there's a river, the famous river that uh, uh, connects at the end, and that was really our uh, our, our beach, our ocean, our, our you know, our, our way to relax. Um, you know, night swimming and wh whatever time we had, that was uh, el parche, which is what you say in, 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 in Colombian slang. Um, other than that, you know, every every mo every extra hour that we could sleep, I think we all took that opportunity. And um, in the mountain, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think. It, it, it's, it was such beautiful locations. I have a camera with me at all times. It, it was nice to not have a phone, not have music, not have, um, I mean, I had, music in Spanish, but, you know, I just kind of wanted to, uh, stay in that, in that, in that lifestyle. Um, and it wasn't hard to, um, continue. <laughs> in, in the jungle, we couldn't go any, we, there was nowhere to go. We were just there. So on days that when I wasn't filming, I read a lot and I read every night by flashlight, which was really special to go to sleep and just being quiet, being by yourself, being in that beautiful place. It was really intense. And jumping in that water every day was magical. That you did have to hold on to something or you would get washed away. <laughs>
<laughs> so if you were by yourself, it was uh, you had Not to take good, good care. Yeah. No, no, no. I imagine you didn't really have any downtime. If you weren't filming, you were Alejandro, working on the next day shoot. Oh, my goodness. Alejandro <laughs> was there. I don't know how he did it. I honestly don't. I had a, a day off after seven days straight. Alejandro had 46 days straight. I don't even know how many. Yeah, was it? I mean, we always talk to actors about the difficulty of the conditions of shooting because they're the ones on screen. But when it comes to the jungle and it comes to the mountains, I mean, there are always the crew and there is the director who generally doesn't sleep and doesn't stop working when the camera's cut. Was it difficult for you? I mean, it was definitely the hardest thing I've ever done. I was at the limits of what I could do with, with body and mind. I mean, I think we all were. Because um, we're playing within an iconic and a big genre. I mean, the film appeals to something that's allegorical, but epic and big, even though it has the intimacy of this group, of, of this mini society. And so um, it's a film with all the no's, right? Uh, underage kids, non-actors, Hollywood actors, animals, aerial shots, underwater shots, remote locations. And uh, we were just going and going. It didn't stop. And I mean, on the first day of shooting, we took someone down in an ambulance. And on the last day of shooting, we all left with helmets and rafts. And I had my moment where I got carried out on a stretcher. I mean, I mean, I, I think everyone cried. you carried out on a stretcher? Because I couldn't stand up. <laughs> um, <laughs> just that. <laughs> the suffering was real. The suffering was real. It was, it was contagious, but we just kept going. I mean, everyone felt that we were making something that's not whether you like it or not. It's just something new, something visceral, something that just would just jump out of the screen. And I think that people are living that roller coaster effect, the viewers, and that's been really satisfying. Because one thing is all the backstory, everything you did, but at the end of the day, what matters is what's on the screen. Oh, yeah. And um, and I think people are living that, that, that film that they live... Not only with their with their with their head, but you know, in the pit of their stomach, and that's what I think. That's how we felt while we were shooting. Right? So much of the film, uh, or a good portion of the film, is figuring out where you are and what's going on as a viewer. And I love that. I love being thrown into a world that isn't easily explained right at, right off the top. And then when you figure out what's going on, just kind of being heartbroken and taken aback by everything that happens afterwards. Um, it's a really beautiful film. Uh, congratulations. Thank you so much for being here. It opens this weekend, right? People can see it. Yep. Today. 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 And I know you guys are doing Q&As as well in New York. People are in New York. And go see it on the big screen. It's a film that should be seen on a big screen. And give them a round of applause for being here. Let's hear it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>